Welcome back to the afternoon session for today's ECRIN International Clinical Trials Day event. This session is called a Patient Perspective on Platform Trials, and I'm Fanula Keen. I'm a Clinical Trials Project Manager for the WHO Solidarity Trial in Ireland, working with the Clinical Research Facility in University College Cork, Ireland. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, which is Valentina Stramiello. Uh, Valentina is the head of programs at um, European Patient Forum, and she's experienced in managing EU projects in, in the health sector. Valentina is also the vice chair of the HTAI Patient and Citizen Involvement Interest Group and, members of the, and, and is also a member of the scientific board of the Val Debron Research Institute. Valentina, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to represent the patient perspective on clinical trials. So before moving to the topic, uh, I'd like to share a few words about uh, the European Patients Forum for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, just to share, you know, European, the European Patients Forum is a European umbrella patient organization. We have 75 member organizations, including a EU level disease specific platform and, non and national non disease specific uh, coalitions. Our vision is that a Europe, uh, a Europe where patient organizations are valued partners in creating equitable, person centered, accessible, and sustainable healthcare systems based on patients' unique expertise. And just to frame a bit what is the perspective of EPF in everything we do. We always try to put the patient perspective at the center of policies. Next slide, please. Uh, so we uh, like to move directly to the topic. Uh, when it comes to um, patient perspective in clinical trials, we included this into the framework of clinical research. And we acknowledge that the clinical research landscape is changing and evolving. And uh, we uh, acknowledge that uh, this evolution, of course, comes with innovation that uh, can have a very positive impact on patients' lives. Uh, it can even transform their lives and uh, make their quality of life uh, better uh, thanks to, to new technologies uh, like molecular target pathways, genome sequencing, or cell therapies. But of course, we also acknowledge that um, Innovation comes with a trade-off with uh, affordability and health budgets. So we need to look for innovation that is also valuable. And the question often is, what is considered as valuable innovation? Well, from a patient perspective, innovation is valuable when it brings uh, quality of life to patients. So it's innovation that matters to patients. It's innovation that uh, can make also uh, care more patient-centered. It's about uh, making access to medicines uh, easier for patients. Uh, also, when it comes to no medical options or self-management solutions, or even changing care delivery. So everything that uh, can improve not only the quality of life, but make, make also uh, living with the condition easier for patients, if we consider it as valuable innovation. Of course, um, Innovation doesn't affect only therapies, but uh, also everything that has to deal with uh, patient lives. So it, it, has a, it comes with the potential social change. Uh, last but not least, we, we also consider that um, new therapies are not just uh, better because they are new, but because they, make an, they have an impact on better systems. So, it's, we have to stress always that uh, novelty is not necessarily uh, the best thing to have. Next one, please. Uh, we also stress and uh, promote the role of patients and patient organizations in clinical trials. And that's because uh, we consider that patient perspective is key and different from and complementary to the, the perspective of lay people. And this is because uh, patients come with uh, their first-hand experience in living with the, with the condition, uh, chronic or lifelong. Uh, this is something that lay people cannot represent, unfortunately, because not living with a chronic condition doesn't uh, put them in the position to re truly represent that, that perspective. 
That's why we think that patients and patient organizations should be meaningfully involved in all stages from the defining research priorities to trial design and the review of proposal, trial implementation and publications, let's say throughout the whole life cycle. We also uh, stress that the European Commission should uh, play a key role here to monitor very carefully the implementation of the regulation to ensure that ethics committees also include the representative of patients. Next one, please. I thought of uh, focusing my uh, presentation on three key aspects. Uh, when it comes to clinical trials, we always have to consider that patients entering trials, they trust uh, a system, an organizational system that they don't, don't necessarily know. So they really put their trust into the process, but to, to really truly and uh, meaningfully contribute, they also need to be empowered. So there are three key and vital aspects we may have to take into account when talking about patient perspective and tools that may make also the patient experience a better one. The first one is a meaningful informed consent. That's very important because it helps to raise awareness about the benefits and risks for, for patients. Uh, the second one is understandable information on trial results. This is also key because it's all about the transparency of results. And patients and patient communities at large should be available to be aware of what are the trial results and see also monitor what is the potential pathway of a new treatment coming uh, into the market. And then last but not least, the patient education and the engagement. To, so patient education, it's key to build capacity. And these will lead to better engagement and also empowerment of patients. Now I will look more closely into the first point, informed consent. We consider it as a cornerstone of ethics. And that's because from, from our perspective, informed consent is a key document uh, is a decision aid that should enable a patient to make a meaningful decision about whether or not to participate in a given study. So it's not just a tick the box exercise as it still often happens, unfortunately. It's uh, still perceived uh, as, a, as a tool to protect researchers, not patients. While we think really informed consent is uh, really the tool to allow better engagement of patients in the process. Patients also should have access to quality information. And this also makes a difference when it comes to really uh, keeping them on board throughout the trial. Um, and also it's very important to, to keep them uh, really willing to, to, to still participate into the trial. Of course, uh, what we need uh, is a more of opportunity to consider innovative models for informed consent to really empower patients. And we are aware that in the last years, there are more and more options coming up, uh, making use of digital health tools, uh, making informed consent not just on paper, but uh, provide them on the digital solutions like uh, e-consent, make use of uh, multimedia, and there are other elements that are coming into the landscape, big data for sure, and uh, the, the option of dynamic consent, for example. These are all novelties that may make, they, that may, may make the, the informed consent tool even more complex, but also uh, expand the scope of this document. Next one, please. Yeah, I'd like to stress a few aspects uh, that are really key to patients. And uh, this is a roadmap that was developed by UPATI, the European Patients Academy on Therapeutic Innovation. And as you can see, I have uh, stressed this part about informed consent. It indicates what is vital to patients, what they expect from informed consent. We can move to the next slide where I further elaborate. And so you can see from, for patients, documents and processes for informed consent should be co-designed with patients to ensure that information, informed consent is meaningful. Of course, here we're not talking about the same patients that will be enrolled in the trials, but patient representatives, advocates who could uh, really uh, help 
the, the, the team to develop uh, an informed consent that is understandable to patients. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, lay language will be used. Sentences need to be short and concrete. So keep the, the language as simple as, as possible. Use as much as you can lay terms before medical ones, because this really puts the patients in the position to understand what is being, uh, the information that is being shared. As, as far as you can, use visual illustrations, glossary of terms, even summaries of one page might help. Last but not least, what is very important also to when you, you meet the patients to, that will sign informed consent, this is also an opportunity to discuss data protection, uh, privacy, and the possibility to share patients' data for further research. It's very important for patients to be aware that their data can be reused, but of course, they need to provide consent if the, this should be done. Next one, please. Uh, yeah, I'm moving to the next point that I had shared. So the, imp the importance of information on trial results. Of course, we are aware of the EU clinical trials regulation, and I'm aware that there will be some further discussion around this. But from our perspective, we find these regulations very useful and improvement compared to the previous legislation. And that's because uh, it provides a compulsory registration of trials, a publication of all trial results, irrespective of outcomes, and this should happen one year after the end of the trial. Also, publicly accessible EU database and the obligation to provide the lay summary of, summaries of all results. And these are quite key uh, elements that as ETF we have really pushed and uh, advocated for, so we are happy to see them here and hopefully be to, to, to be implemented. We are aware that the guidelines are being drafted and provided. And yeah, I want to elaborate more on this because I know there will be a session on uh, discussing the, uh, the work being done by EMA. Next one, please. To conclude, actually, this is really the last point. I was anticipating the need to educate patients and engage them. And uh, just a few words about the importance of education. It's not just to, to make the engagement of patients more efficient, but there is another element, which is the fact that the trainings and uh, announcing the knowledge of the patients can help to even the balance of power in, the multi, in a multi-stakeholder team. Also, training is important to realize a deeper level of involvement, of course, but we should also consider that these shouldn't be a required qualification or barrier to participation. Also, involvement of lay patients, people who don't, know, who don't necessarily have a huge understanding of the topic could come on board to contribute and bring their, uh, their knowledge. To conclude a few words about the work that as EPF we have conducted in the Paradigm project, a project on a patient engagement. It was an IMI project that was concluded in uh, 2020. And uh, some recommendations from the project to show the importance of alignment of research priorities with the real and met needs. This is very key for, for patients because they would like to see that research goes into the direction of addressing patients' needs instead of any other interest, because it's really where research would make a difference in patients' lives. Uh, there could be improved design, so we have to pay more attention to ethics, the practicalities and, and points. Uh, we need to work, as I had anticipated, uh, the, we have to improve the way uh, material is provided, produced and designed. Uh, of course, we have to take into account that uh, more time spent on the, on the recruitment process may lead also to fewer dropouts. And this, will, can, this can make uh, uh, the trials themselves less costly in the very end. So if you uh, aim to, to bring on board patients and make sure they stay, maybe it's better to invest a bit more time on the recruitment stage. Um, of course, uh, the engagement of patients uh, comes with a potential challenge to researchers. Hopefully, this is well accepted. 
And uh, we have to make sure that um, the findings and uh, of research, championing of research can be widely disseminated. Last but not least, we need also to make sure that there is public awareness that trust in science. So this is maybe something that nowadays with the COVID-19 pandemic is growing, but we also see the challenges that science is face, facing because of the lack of understanding. It's, it, this leads also to issues around health literacy and the need for education. That's all for my, from my side for the moment. And, uh, I'm happy to respond to questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Valentina. That was a really interesting and thought-provoking presentation um, and certainly has raised a few questions for myself. Um, there's a question here in the chat and it is asking us about lay summaries. Have they to be available on a public database um, and are they approved by ethics committees or others also? I think that people working at TMA will be better in a better place to respond than me, but I think so. The response should be yes, indeed. Ethics committees should review the material. And um, yeah, the this should be made available publicly. That's what we aim for, at least as EPF. Okay. And so, uh, Valentina, um, just uh, one more question then in the on the Q&A. Um, could we have a reference for the IMI project on patient engagement, please? And we would also welcome any additional comments on dynamic consent and e-consent, if possible, please. Yes, of course, I can provide in the chat the contact details of the IMI project paradigm. That's no, not a problem at all. Uh, regarding dynamic consent, this is a concept that we are investigating at the moment, and it's uh, a way to allow the patients to provide consent to share data uh, on a case-by-case -case scenario. So it's not a giving away their data for future research, being left blind on what on the way this, uh, their data will be used, but having the chance to, to allow the reuse of their data, being aware of which type of research it is and uh, which is the purpose of, of course. So there are some technical aspects that have to be taken into account and uh, it comes with some complexity. We believe that probably blockchain could allow that. There is another project called Pharma Ledger where we are involved at EPF that is, is looking actually into these aspects and uh, really um, testing how dynamic consent could uh, also allow better engagement of patients and disclosure of data safe disclosure of data, of course. But talking about e-consent, again, this is something we are investigated in this project, Pharma Ledger. And uh, we are looking into the, the way the tool can be provided uh, digitally, but of course there are issues that are being raised around, for example, the signature and making sure that it's actually the patient or the carer of the patient signing uh, so that there are a few aspects that we still need to look at. And of course, nothing is written in stone yet. So it's still uh, ongoing um, investigation, let's say. Thank you, Valentina. Just one or two more quick questions. Is there a better way to involve minority populations in research? This is a very big issue, actually. We are also looking into it, uh, ZPF. Uh, we are aware of the challenges and the bias that can be created by not involving minority groups and any kind of groups that are more vulnerable and not e so easy to reach out to. So what we are trying to do for the moment, at least, is to raise awareness about the need to, to bring on board, uh, to be more inclusive and bring on board more diverse uh, patient profiles. So not, uh, not the standard the white man in their middle age, but to be a bit more, uh, I mean, bring broader profiles. So younger ones is possible or older ones, uh, women as well. We know that there is an issue about gender. Uh, this, this is an issue that requires a lot of awareness raising. And what we are also trying to do is to, to bring on board those communities that also focus on this aspect. 
not, I don't want to really use the opportunity of this meeting to promote uh, other uh, events, but this is a topic we are going to look at in um, the, the patient engagement open forum, for example. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Valentina. I'm going to have to, to stop you there. We had a few more questions ready for you, but maybe we can ask you after. Um, thank you very much, Valentina. Thank you.